evening, everyone. I hope we've all had a good Sunday. I know I've enjoyed my Sunday afternoon. It was once again great to have the grandkids here with us today. It's always good to enjoy them. Okay, singing out of the Blue Book tonight, let's turn over to number 87 and start with Joy to the World. Christmas time, a Christmas song. Let us for a <laughs> from this morning. Uh, one more Christmas song. How about Silent Night? Let's turn back a page to 85. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Great to be held back in the house of the Lord, is not? Amen. Thank you. So we would like to remind everyone that signed up for the Christmas event, that it will be happening next Sunday morning. So if you put your name on the list, this coming Sunday morning is the day. Upcoming birthdays for this month. On the 16th, Amy Sultan, Christine Medina. On the 20th, Steve Bigelow. On the 26th, Judy Asher. Do we have any additions to our prayer list that we went over this morning? Yes. We will be traveling Tuesday after we begin uh, for our doctor's appointment. He has one, and I have two. Okay. I just have one. My neighbor Stanley had his feet cold and he's struggling. Stanley? Oh, he's losing the knees. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Okay. So there is a picture of Kit in the foyer with some information on her accident and what happened. Erica. My best friend up at camp and the other camp host lady that I, my friend up there, her husband is went into the emergency room, the same breaths. And they think he has congestive heart failure, so she might be going to Medford because there's no heart cardiologist around here that they trust. And so they might be moving and I might be leaving. But let's pray for Rex that he's really old and he smokes like a train. Mm -hmm. So let's pray that he uh, makes it through this. Okay, prayers for Rex. Okay, we are going to lift up special prayers for Sarah this evening. Not just for her currently, but for her finding housing and for her future and for her mental health. Please bow with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening with heavy hearts. Our sister Sarah in dire need of your love and grace this evening. Please be with her and help her with her condition and help her to see the light. Please help her to find housing and comfort. Please be with our other members this evening, Heavenly Father. Please be with Garrett's mother, Marty. Help her get over her cold and please be with our brother, Dick, and his physical challenge. Please be with Lauren, Matthew's daughter, who's still in the hospital. Please be with Stanley and Kit and Max. Pray for love and guidance. Please be with all the victims of the tornado in the south and help the people in need. Please help us to do our part, to help others and lift others and to spread your word. Please continue to watch over us and bless us. Please be with Reverend Derek this evening as he brings us the message. All these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, Brother Derek. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. If you want to turn your Bibles to Isaiah, ninth chapter. That's where we're going to be tonight. <clears throat> Isaiah 9. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Isaiah. And <clears throat> Prophecies about the coming Messiah. We thank you for the insight that you gave him and what it all means. We pray that as we explore it this evening, that you help us understand it better. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, has everyone got their Christmas shopping done? <laughs> funny. That's not funny. <laughs> no? Yeah. <laughs> we accidentally bought two puzzles while we were in uh, True Value uh, oh, yeah? cars. Yeah, and they were there, so we were like, ooh. 
<laughs> Gotta get them while you can. Yeah. Well, when you're shopping for Christmas presents, um, as Franklin mentioned this morning, uh, some people are hard to buy for. <laughs> some people, it seems like they have everything, or they, uh, they're hard to uh, figure out what they could possibly need or want, or some people, when you ask them what they want, they say, I don't need anything, and then you gotta scratch your head and try to figure something out. <laughs> so some people, you know, it's, it's hard to, to pick presents out, and then some people that you give presents to regularly, you know, it's you know easy for a while, and then like your wife, <laughs> then after a while, <laughs> you know, you're trying to come up with new ideas, and new things to, to get your spouse and things like that. So I'll just get them a pair of socks or somebody is just Yeah. Matthew did yes. did a good job with that. We always lose our socks in the dryer, so we always need it's a mystery. We need new ones. <laughs> but uh, well how much harder would it be if you you had to uh, buy a present for the whole world? One present that you could give for the whole world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're still my thunder. <laughs> if you were to give a, a Christmas present to the world, what would it be? Well, um, there's a there's a song, there's a Christmas song that talks about this. It's called My Grown Up Christmas List. Have you heard of it? And uh, his wish for the world was no more lives torn apart. Wars would never start, that time would heal the heart, that everyone would have a friend, and right would always win, and love would never end. This is my grown up Christmas list. And this is something that we all long for that, that broken lives would be mended, that broken relationships uh, would be made whole, that broken hearts would be healed. That the lonely would be found, that the oppressed would be permanently set free. That love would triumph. You know, if someone could give the world a gift that would fulfill all those needs, all those desires, what a great Christmas present that would be. And that's what Christmas is all about. The first Christmas, God gave to the world the gift that it needed the most. Like Gordon said, it's Jesus. Jesus came to make the broken whole, to heal those that were hurting, to set the captives free, to save us from hell and sin, and to give us everlasting life. Well, 700 years before it ever took place, it was prophesied. Isaiah uh, has several prophecies about the coming Messiah. And one of them is found in the ninth chapter. He wrote it all down. Chapter 9, starting in verse 1. But that time of darkness and despair will not be forever upon God's covenant people. In fact, while the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali is being held in contempt by God because of the paganism of its people, in the day of the Messiah comes, he will make that territory glorious by his work there. That is the territory that will then be Gentile territory, Galilee and beyond the Jordan. Those who walk in the darkness of ignorance and sin will see a great light. And this light will illuminate the way for those who live in the realms of darkness. You, Yahweh, will multiply your covenant people. You will increase their joy. Your multiplying people will be filled with joy like that of reapers when the harvest time has come. And like that of men, dividing up the treasures that they have captured. When the light comes, God will break the bondage of oppression upon his people by a great, miraculous, divine act of victory over their enemy. At that time, God shall utterly destroy the weapons of those who oppress his people and give his people complete peace. For unto God's people a child will be born. God will give his people a son. And the government of God will be administered by this Son. 
These will be the royal titles indicating his nature and character. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His government will be one of continued growth and peace and it will never end. He will occupy the throne of his father David and will rule in perfect justice and in righteousness in his kingdom forever. And God's zeal to vindicate his faithfulness and his zeal for his people will accomplish all of this. So the coming of the Messiah, the light, and we, it's interesting all the different passages we've been studying in 1 John and in John and now in Isaiah, talking about this coming light, right? It's the, all the different writers are prophesying about the light that Jesus is going to bring. He's going to bring atonement for his people. He's coming to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham. And from his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Christ's coming brought about the multiplication of the covenant nation through the coming of his, his kingdom. <coughs> and the calling of the Gentiles, that's, that's us, into that part of that kingdom. So Isaiah, he prophesied seven year, 700 years before Christ that God's kingdom was going to be extended uh, to the Gentiles. And he mentions it in other uh, passages uh, as well. <clears throat> but Isaiah looks into the future and he sees that, that God is going to do something so amazing that it's going to cause all the people of the earth to be full of joy, to be rejoicing. In fact, he goes on to say it's the kind of joy that a farmer experiences when he has completed the harvest of an abundant year, a time of feasting and joy. And he also says that it's like the joy that one has when a terrible enemy and its army are defeated by the treasures of that, and the treasures of that army are divided up and they're shared among the troops. And that's uh, the sort of joy that we're supposed to have this Christmas, like the, the joy of dividing up the treasures so what is the source of all this joy? Well, the answer is found in verse 6. For unto God's people a child will be born. God will give his people a son. So all this joy for the birth of a baby. And you know, new mothers that have babies, they have a lot of joy. There's a lot of pictures, and grandparents show the pictures to everyone else too. But there's great uh there's great joy that happens with just the birth of any baby, right? But especially this baby, because he, when he grew to be a man, he would do amazing things. The word child here is the, the first word of the Hebrew sentence, and this indicates that all the emphasis should be put on this word, on this word child. This son of David, this son of the Most High, he actually came to us in a form of a child. The humanity of the Messiah is it, pointed out here. And Isaiah says that the government of God is going to be administered by the Son. Now, in Isaiah's day, there was no Congress elected by the people, the nations, uh, including Israel. They were ruled by a king. Remember, they, they were being ruled by God, and he was supposed to be their king. But then they said, we want to be like all the other nations. And so God let them, but there were some consequences that came with that. But uh, this king, this particular king that was ruling during this time of Isaiah, he had absolute power, and he did whatever he wanted to do. And, but this coming king would not be just any king. He would be the king, the king of all kings. And this is exactly what Israel desperately needed because the king that was reigning at the time, King Ahaz, he was one of the worst kings that was ruling uh, during this time that Isaiah was writing and speaking. Now, Isaiah was a prophet for 50, or 50 some years, he was a prophet. So he prophesied for a very long time. But Ahaz was a very weak king. He was the king of <laughs> Judah, the southern um, tribe. And uh, some of the tribes in the south were good. In fact, the only, only, the only good ones that came out of Israel were from the southern tribe. All the ones in the north were pretty much evil. 
Uh, but there were some good ones and there were some bad ones in the, in the South. But he was a very foolish king and he had disobeyed God and his word. And he went after his own clever strategies instead of following what God's desire and God's will would be. And uh, he was trying to do what he thought was best according to men's plans, you know, what would save the nation, what would keep the nation safe. But as a result of not listening to God and going after his own uh, plans, Assyria came in and they destroyed the, the northern part of Israel. Remember, they, they were carried off into um, uh, Assyria, took them and scattered them, and they really never came back again. And then um, they came down and they tried to destroy the, the southern part of Israel as well. But this, this, this great army was headed his way. And so this was a very dark time in the history of Israel. And so Isaiah is prophesying uh, this evil king Ahaz is ruling. They were about to conquer. And so Isaiah, he needs to bring some, some hope some light to this people. And it, it, we need the same thing, don't we? Uh, we're looking at some dark days in America. But if you, if you go back to chapter eight in the last two verses, uh, starting with verse 21, it says, my people are going to be led away captive, distressed and weary and hungry. And because they are hungry, those who do not thirst those who do not trust me will rave and shake their fists at heaven and they will curse their king and their God. And wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and despair and they will be thrust into the darkness of captivity. Now this prophecy that he's prophesying, you know, for us, it's ancient history. For people in Isaiah's day, they were looking to the, the future. But uh, this actually happened, you know, we know through the history, uh, through the Bible, it's recorded for us. Um, and too often we make the same kind of choices that Ahaz makes here. You know, when you reject God's word and you try to come up with your own clever plans to figure out how to, to do things, um, it seems wise at the time, but uh, it doesn't ever work out if we're not listening to God. And it causes distress in our lives, it, it causes darkness. So the reason we live in a, we live in a messed up world, a world for, full of suffering and pain, the Bible says is because we've turned our backs on God, who has made us. We've turned our back on His Word. And we know that that has happened in this country. And maybe today, you know, some of you are experiencing some personal darkness in your life. And you look at your life and you, you realize that this, this is something that's happened because you've wandered away from God. You're living according to your own plans. You're pursuing your own desires. And where it's taken you is kind of a messy place. You know, there, there is a hunger inside of us that is never satisfied unless it's satisfied with, with God himself. And um, we know that you know, we can come out of this despair and darkness if we trust in the Lord, if we, we follow the plan that he has for us. There's hope. And uh, for all of us today, no matter what your situation may be, you know, we need to be reminded that there's hope that, that can sustain us through the dark times that we're facing. Whether it's just the dark times in our country or maybe that you're going through personally in your own life. But there's hope in the birth of this child, this prophecy of the coming king. So look with me again at verse 1. <clears throat> See what kind of change this king is going to bring. But that time of darkness and despair will not be forever upon God's people. In fact, while the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali is being held in contempt by God, because of the paganism of its people, in the day that the Messiah comes, he will make that territory glorious by his work there. That is the territory that then will be Gentile territory, Galilee and beyond the Jordan. 
So Isaiah prophesies that the, the, the future glory of God will have its beginning in Galilee. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Uh, a region that's despised by most of, of Palestine. Of course, you know, the people that were that Isaiah was running to at this time, um, they would not know the reality of this prediction. Like I said, it was hundreds of years you know, before Jesus ever came on the scene. But they could still have faith and believe in the prophecy of this coming Messiah, just the way that we look at the second coming. We may never see the second coming on this earth anyway. We might see it from above. But, uh, but we still have that hope. You know, it's something that gets us through the day that Jesus might come back today. And it was the same thing for them. <laughs> there was this coming prophecy of Jesus coming the first time that would give them hope to get through the day. And so... This land that was soon going to be dis, uh, devastated by the Assyrian army was one day going to be remade glorious by the coming of Jesus. So this promised king is going to do glorious things in the north, around Galilee, around the, the lands of Nazareth. A king who would bring joy in this place of anguish. A king who would going to bring glory in this place of humiliation. He would bring light into this world of darkness. Look at verse 2. Those who walk in the darkness of ignorance and sin will see a great light. This light will illuminate the way for those who live in the realms of deep darkness. So this great light is going to come at some future time. God's going to turn his anger into God's glory upon his people. Right now, God is angry with his people, and pretty soon he's going to take the southern tribes into captivity into Babylon for 70 years. This is right, you know, before all of that happens. Um, but later, after they go through all that, then God's going to bless his nation again. They're going to rebuild Jerusalem. They're going to rebuild the temple. And then God is going to bring his Messiah. And he's going to make this place glorious. He's going to bring his light, the light of his son into this world. He's going to begin his public ministry in this area in Galilee. He was raised there in the village of, of Nazareth. You know, he called most of his apostles from that, from that territory. He spent a lot of his ministry up in Galilee. And uh, he had a great following in, in that area of Galilee. <clears throat> so this northern area of the, the Promised Land, it was a, the first... You know, at this time, it was the first to turn away from God. Um, you know, remember when uh, there was a divided kingdom. The north was separated from the southern part. The, the, the king, uh, Jeroboam, he decided that he was going to make golden calves that you could worship up in the north. He didn't have to go down to Jerusalem, down to the temple. Don't make a long trip down there. Let me just come to this, this cow and worship it. <laughs> And that was the beginning of the end of the northern uh, tribes of Israel. And so they, they, were, they turned against God. This was that area. They were taken captive by the Caesarean army. There was many warnings. It's not like God didn't give them many warnings. You know, there was lots and lots of prophecies, uh, lots of prophets that came to the north and prophesied about the coming doom, but they didn't listen. And then even when they were taken away, their southern sister, as the scriptures call her, uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't learn the lessons from the northern tribes that were taken away. And they followed in their same footsteps. And so they were taken away to, to Babylon later. But it was here that God was going to bless this area because he's going to send his son. He was going to make some important changes. He was going to bring his grace. And that's something that uh, would totally glorify the land of Israel and beyond. So this king that was to do all these amazing things, he's revealed to us in verse 6. For unto God's people a child will be born. God will give his people a son. The government of God is going to be administered by the son. And these are his royal titles, indicating his nature and character. Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. 
Well, these aren't names that uh, you give to a mere human. This is the king. This is God wrapped in flesh. I mean, who else could live up to such names, right? To us, a son is given. So he was a human child, but yet he was given. This is a gift. It's all about Christmas. This is God's gift to us. He's given his child, this gift from God, his divine son. This was the, God, the gift that God chose to give us at Bethlehem on Christmas. So Jesus, the king, that's what Christ means. It means the anointed one. Jesus the King, he was God the Son. And, you know, this is the mystery of Christmas. This is the wonderful news that we are to proclaim to the whole world. That this King, you know, is everything that Israel so desperately needed and everything that we so desperately need as well. So unlike the King of their day, Ahaz, and his foolish, wicked plans that he was making, uh, and we have leaders that make foolish plans as well. But they're not able to protect their people. This king, Ahaz, he wasn't able to protect his people. And uh, our, our government isn't able to protect us too, but we do have one that can protect us. A king that is above all kings. And Galatians chapter 2 verse 3 tells us that in Jesus are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Isn't that a great verse? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if you want to find wisdom, you want to find knowledge, Jesus is where you find that. And so uh, he is called wonderful. Now a lot of people get this mixed up because they think it means a wonderful counselor. And he is a wonderful counselor, but in the original Hebrew, there are two separate words. It's that he's, he's wonderful. That's part of his character. It can also be translated, he's a wonder. It can be translated that way. So he's wonderful, but he is also a wonder to behold. You know, the scriptures in the Gospels that said people were amazed at him and the things that he did. So he's a wonder to behold. That's kind of the idea of it. it it's some, someone that's full of wonder, and he, he causes others uh, to, be, to wonder at him. And he also causes wonderful things to happen. I mean, everywhere Jesus went, didn't he cause wonderful things to happen? <clears throat> so the root word, it refers to something that's unusual. You know, something that uh, awakens astonishment in people. Um, you know, there were a lot of wonders in the Old Testament, and when it used that word, it usually meant a miracle. When God called Moses at the burning bush, God told Moses to go down to Egypt, to Pharaoh, to ask him to let his people go, and that when Pharaoh refused, that God was going to strike the Egyptians with all his wonders, is the word that he used which we know meant his miracles, right? All the plagues and everything that he brought. So he's going to perform all these wonders, all these signs. And they, they point to Jesus' miracles. You know, it was something unusual, something unexplainable. It was a work of God. It could only be explained by God. You know, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said, we know you're from God because nobody could do these things except that they were from God. So... They were, they were a miracle. It's unexplainable. Uh, it's also a word that the Psalms likes to use, usually in the context of, of God's people uh, praising God for all his wonderful works. Psalm 9-1 says, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. Psalm 26-7 uh, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. Psalm 75, 1. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. Men tell of your wonderful deeds. <coughs> He's also called a counselor. Now, if Jesus holds all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge then there's probably nothing you can't sort out for us, right? 
Uh, he's our guide for correction, for encouragement. He's going to lead us to all truth. He is the truth. That's one of his names, too. Not in this context, but in other places in the Bible. You know, and if we see him as the greatest counselor that ever lived, we need to be turning to him more, right? Uh, Isaiah 11, 1 says, A shoot will come up from the root of Jesse. From it, his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And this is a prophecy of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is going to rest on Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of power, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So this son that was to be born, this son that was given to us, he will have the Holy Spirit of counsel on him. And we know that that happened because when Jesus came out of the baptistry, John witnessed it and he wrote about it, that the Spirit of God came on him like a dove. And from that time on, he was anointed and he had the Spirit of God on him and uh, went through with him for, throughout the rest of his life. But he's the best counselor that the world has ever seen. Why is he the best counselor? Because first of all, he's sympathetic. Listen to what Hebrews 4.15 says. Therefore, since we have a high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. But we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he's without sin. So let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So when we're in need, we can run with confidence to receive grace and mercy. Why? Because he can sympathize with us. He's lived a human life. He experienced every temptation and trial that we've experienced and he's also God and he can help us, he can counsel us to get through any kind of situation, any kind of problem that we're going through. He's also wise, you know, he shares his wisdom with us. You know, men are always searching for wisdom. They're searching for the meaning of life, they're, they're searching for solutions to their problems, right? In fact, they spend a lot of money uh, People spend a lot of money seeking wisdom from psychologists and human counselors, which there's nothing wrong with going to a human counselor. But if you're really looking for a perfect counselor, you can find one in Jesus. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus. He knows everything. He knows of all about your needs. He has all the answers that you're looking for. He knows what's best for you personally. He knows how to solve your problems. He gives wise counsel, and it's free. That's the best part. <laughs> and so he and he's there all anytime they need him. You want you want to get counseling at three o'clock in the morning? He's there. You don't have to worry about disturbing him and getting him out of bed. He's also called here by Isaiah, mighty God. So here's one of those uh, scriptures that where. It's talking about Jesus, and it's saying he's God. He's a mighty God. You don't get any more powerful than a mighty God. Literally, it means something like a, a God hero. You know, there's many movies out now that, that talk about hero, heroes and um, people that can overcome. But you know, God is the ultimate hero. He's the victor of all victors, and he gives us victory. He's this all-powerful God, and he wants to act on our behalf. He has defeated sin and death, and he will destroy the evil one as well. He has the power to, to heal and to forgive us, to restore us. He has the power to resurrect us through his resurrection power because he's a mighty God. So this is a good verse to remember, to point to Jesus' deity. And because he's all-powerful, it means that he can be very helpful. He lives within us and through his Holy Spirit so that he can accomplish all these things. And he will enable us to change us from the inside out. 
But this king, he also cares for us too. Because Isaiah goes on to say that his leadership will be like that of a loving father. Except that we'll never be let down by this father. We'll, we'll never have to experience the loss of his support in our lives or his leadership. Because he's an everlasting father. He will not only be the father to us here and now, but when we get to heaven. He's before and above time. He's eternally like this father. He cares for us. Peter says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. He'll protect us like a father should protect their children. He's everlasting. He's going to watch over us. He's the source of everlasting life. He said, whoever believeth in me will not perish, but have their everlasting life. And lastly, he's the king of kings who brings wholeness and well-being into our lives because, Isaiah says, he's the prince of peace. He brings us peace with God. One of the reasons he brings us peace with God is because he reconciles us back to God. That's one of the big uh, Christian words, theological words, reconciliation. He brings us peace because we were enemies of God. We have sin separated us from God. But Jesus makes us to have peace with God. So he reconciles us with God and he reconciles us with each other. Um, scripture talks many times about the reconciliation uh, from men to men. And he also brings us any inner peace in our souls. Because he takes our guilt, he takes our sin, he takes all of that away, and he paid for it all. And he gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. When you're going through difficult times, he can give you this kind of peace that just calms your nerves and helps you get through things that normally you wouldn't be able to get through. In 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 1, it says that, God is a God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. He can comfort us in all of our troubles because he truly is the Prince of Peace. Another aspect of peace is that he's going to bring an end to all war and conflict. It's not going to happen until he comes back, but he is going to bring an end to all war. It will cease one day. There's not going to be war in heaven. And uh, that's exactly what, what Isaiah says is going to happen. This king, he says, will liberate his people. He will liberate them from their, their slavery. Look at, uh, look at verses 4 and 5. When the light comes, God will break the bondage of oppression upon his people by a great, miraculous, divine act of victory over their enemy. At that time, God shall utterly destroy the weapons of those who oppress his people and give his people complete peace. So Jesus is going to bring an end to all war because of the peace that he's made for us on the cross. The immediate consequences of the sin of, of Israel and of Judah was that they would be captives. That was the immediate consequence for their sin. But, you know, we know that that would is symbolized in a greater slavery and oppression or bondage to sin, a bondage to the devil. Um, but God brought us deliverance through the cross. He freed us from the captivity of sin. And uh, Israel's deliverance is a, is a type of prophecy, you know, that God is going to one day give us complete deliverance from all evil going to destroy the evil one and there won't be sin in heaven. Amen? Amen. So uh, just as he makes this difference, um, it's, it says here he makes a difference in the day of Midian. So just as God delivered his people from the Midianites, is what I think he's talking about there. Remember in the days of Gideon, uh, they had to deal with the, the Midianites and God freed them from the Midianites. So God is going to deliver us from our personal enemies, you know, that we have in this world. But more importantly, the spiritual enemies, Satan and the demonic powers. 
So Isaiah prophesies Jesus is going to bring an end to war and sin and Satan himself. But the peace that we have in Jesus also means this peace with God. You know, like I said, it was this human sin that separated us from God. But the cross removed that. The cross became our bridge back to God. You know, one of the things that Jesus became uh, when he uh, walked this earth and accomplished all that he accomplished was that he became our high priest. And uh, the priest means to be a bridge to God. And Jesus was that ultimate, you know, bridge back to God. He brought this everlasting peace. He brought us a bridge to this eternal home, this eternal life that he's prepared for us. So the, the peace that we have in Jesus, it, it means wholeness. It means freedom from our anxieties. It means harmony with others. It means harmony with God. It's the gift that God means to give us through Jesus. To those who are, are willing to submit to Jesus and to have a, a relationship with him. So he's offering all these things. He wants to offer you his wisdom. He wants to offer you his might. He wants to offer you this fatherly care. He wants to offer you continual guidance in your life. And he wants to offer you everlasting wholeness. Sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? So this arrival of King Jesus, you know, it was incredibly good news in history. And it was brought in a very dark time. He has already come. And he has liberated us. He set us free. He did it on the cross, and he will complete that work when he comes back. So through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, we can all find experience this freedom. We can know forgiveness. We can have peace with God. That's why Jesus is the, the Prince of Peace. Now let me ask you today, you know, is he the, your king? Is he the center of your life? Is he the center of your plans, of your choices? Or are you making all your plans and choices like King Ahaz here, on his own, his own initiative, without consulting God? Is Jesus your hope? Is he your joy? He wants to be all those things. He wants to be your friend. Matthew's Gospel, it tells us that Jesus began his ministry in the north, and he preached there, and one of the things that he said when he first started his ministry is he would re, re, uh, preach repentance. And his, his, uh, his ministry, his preaching, was pretty much like John the Baptist. When you read about you know, what it says that John the Baptist preached repentance, and then it talks about when Jesus started his ministry, it's just the same thing, that he preached this, uh, this gospel call of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. That's what he preached to the people. And there's this limited, limited time that God's given us. He's given us this, this window. You know, that we can make get right with God. To repent and to get right with God and to receive all the blessings that we can have in Jesus Christ. Because he wants us to have all these things. He wants us to have a relationship with us. He wants to give us forgiveness and hope. But we have to turn away from our sin and turn to him. In verse 7, Isaiah looks to God's everlasting kingdom. He says, Christ's government will be one of continued growth and peace, and it will never end, it says. He will occupy the throne of David, and he will rule in perfect justice and righteousness. His kingdom will be forever. God's zeal to vindicate his faithfulness and his zeal for his people will accomplish all of this. So you see, the birth of this king marks the beginning of God's everlasting kingdom. In fact, Jesus said when he was walking the earth, you know, he said, the kingdom of God is near. He said, the kingdom of God is upon you. The kingdom of God is here. Because Jesus was there. And he was starting his church. He was starting his kingdom. And uh, wherever Jesus is, there his kingdom is. We're his subjects. We're part of his kingdom. And we long for a kingdom like that, with a, with a real king that has our best interests at heart, right? And uh, Jesus is the perfect king. 
and his kingdom will be an everlasting one. It'll reign forever and ever. It'll be the perfect justice. We don't have to worry about injustice, that God is the perfect judge. Uh, but here's the challenge. You know, Isaiah wrote this prophecy 700 years before it was fulfilled. He was writing to those that were still living in the darkness. Uh, but how, how did this prophecy help them? Well, it was like looking down a long tunnel and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, you know you've got a ways to go, but you know there's an end to it, right? And that's kind of the way it is for us. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but we know that there's hope on the way, and we're getting a little bit closer to the light at the end of that tunnel every day. And one day it'll be here. And we won't have to worry about this world anymore. It'll be a thing of the past. And we'll be living in this wonderful place that he's prepared for us. So this is the, the prophecy that was to them, the first coming of the Messiah for us. It's the second coming. And all everything that's going to happen when he comes again. In the seventh chapter, Isaiah gives another prophecy that says, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we know that happened. He came. And he is with us. He's reigning in our hearts through his spirit right now. And he's bringing all those things. So how are we going to live today? I mean, this world is going to continue to get dark. It's going to, it's going to be discouraging every time you turn on the news. You can be sure there's going to be something <coughs> discouraging, something new, <laughs> discouraging, that they want to, to uh, put upon your hearts to to. to Weigh you down, but you know, we have this life, we have this promise, we have this hope, we need to hold on to it. We can't let the things around us get us down. God is going to accomplish all this. He promises to do it, and he will do it in his time. But we need to hold on to that hope, and we need to be full of joy and rejoicing, especially this time of the year when we remember everything that happened at Christmas. That's what Christmas is about, that Jesus came and he was all of these things. And he still is. So the question for you today is, where are your eyes going to be focused this Christmas? Are they going to be focused on the TV and the internet and the despair of today? Or are they going to be focused on the word of God and the promises of scripture and the hope that we have in Jesus? We have been given good news. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son has been given, the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of his peace there will be no end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these promises in Scripture. Thank you for so many prophecies about Jesus, who he was, what he came to do. And we thank you that you have fulfilled these promises and there's other promises that haven't been quite fulfilled yet, but we know that they're coming true just as surely as Isaiah's prophecies came through in the coming of Jesus the first time. And we thank you that we do have this hope, that we have Jesus in our hearts now, and that we have the promise of the second coming. I pray that we can just hold on to the hope, even in dark times, and remember who's in charge, that you're there with us always, and that you love us and you care for us. And help us to remember that. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you again, Derek, for that wonderful message. Let's stand as we have our closing song. We'll sing number 247, softly, uh, 246, softly and tenderly. I wrote it down long here and I said it wrong. Huh? 246, we'll just sing the first verse.
Father, we're so thankful that you come and hear this message this evening. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for Jesus and all that he's done for us and continues to do for us each and every day. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll continue to look to you for all our needs. We thank you for your love and care and we just pray that you with those who are in need that you be near them this evening. Pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Pray for those that are having difficulties in the church and be regular and personal and constant going. And we pray for them in the Bible. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Have a blessed week.